Hello everybody, thank you so much for coming. My name is Kyle Lott. Uh, for those of you that have already been to this presentation once, thank you ever so much for showing up a second time. Uh, my presentation is called Connect Force, uh, Teaching History Through Games, a dicey proposition. Uh, puns will be 90% of this presentation, so I hope that you all enjoy them, and as cheesy as they are, we'll learn to tolerate them by the very end. So, before I get started with this part of the presentation, let me tell you just a little bit about what we're doing and why it's important, uh, how we got started. So, the time is last semester, is last year, second semester. I am a junior in college, and I have no idea what I want to do with my life. Like a lot of young men, I, I'm often sort of like pulled in a number of different directions, and I really don't have any idea what I want to go or what direction my life is taking me. Uh, and I remember talking to my dad about this and being like, yeah, yeah, pops, I have no idea what I want to do. I have no idea where I want to go. Uh, and he goes, don't worry about it. Something, something cool is going to happen. And as a matter of fact, something cool did happen. I was in Dr. Greg Murray's history-based board games class as a student. Uh, second semester of my junior year. And Doc and I had been rolling around the idea of making a card game for my honors presentation. Neither of us were very excited about the prospect of it, and after a few failed attempts and uh, a couple chapters into Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, don't ask me what it has to do with card games because I don't remember, um, we decided to bail the project. I come into class the day after I have that conversation with my father, and Dr. Reed looks at me and goes, hey listen, I have this crazy idea to do a book that uses games to teach history to students. And the rest, as they say in our field, is history. Now, something that like came to our minds, something that's been very, very useful to us, is this idea of rock, paper, scissors, um, and the idea of strategy games in general. And so, I can tell you right now that in one minute, I can make any person in this audience into a strategy gamer. One minute. I can do it with anybody, I swear. Um, and I need somebody who thinks of themselves as not a strategy gamer. Who in the audience doesn't think they're a strategy gamer? Anybody? John, yeah. do you not think of yourself as a strategy gamer? No. All right, get up here. We got, I, I have a way to prove that you are. All right, now before we play this little game, as I mentioned, rock, paper, scissors is important. And so we're going to actually play a game of rock, paper, scissors right now, uh, just to see who gets to go first in this little, uh, this little proof, I guess. Right. Ready? It's so rock, paper, scissors, shoot, best two out of three. Right. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, I won that one. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, you won that one. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, you won. That's the thing. But guess what? I've turned you into a strategy gamer, right there! Look at that, amazing. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. You can go back to your seat. Now, rock, paper, scissors is important, um, and all surprises aside, because it can teach us everything that we need to know about what makes a successful game. Rock, paper, scissors is more than just a game that you play with your friends to decide who gets to take your tray up to the trash can or lunch. Uh, rock, paper, scissors is everything you need to know about making a successful game, and everything that you need to know about integrating games into the lives and lessons of your students. From the game, we developed three principles, and these three principles have been guiding, I guess, guiding lights uh, in this project and in this effort to make games more accessible to the student body. So the first thing about rock, paper, scissors is simplicity, and that's going to be the greatest hallmark of our games. Think of any great game that you've ever played, anything from Monopoly to Battleship to Connect Four, or Connect Force in this case. One of the amazing things about all of these games is they have an incredibly simple premise. Monopoly, go around the board, get more money than everybody else. Battleship, sink your opponent's battleship. Connect Four literally has what you have to do in the game in the game's title itself. The same with something like Guess Who. Simplicity is a huge, huge, huge factor in making not only games more accessible to students, but in making lessons more relatable. The thing about Rock, Paper, Scissors and what makes it so amazing as a game is you need nothing more to play Rock, Paper, Scissors than a functioning limb and an understanding of the rules and another person with those two things. Incredibly simple. I can walk up to any person in this audience right now and play a game of rock, paper, scissors with little to no prep time. If you don't know what rock, paper, scissors is, it doesn't take that long to explain either, which is fantastic. Um, so this is one of the best things about simplicity and why we chose that as our central pillar, is that if a student is, isn't worried about learning the rules so much, they're more able to enjoy the game, and if they're able to enjoy the game, they're more able to connect the lessons they learn in-game with the lessons that we're trying to teach them. Every one of the games that we designed throughout the semester all have simplicity in mind. Strategy. One of the most interesting things about rock, paper, scissors is the level of deep strategy within the game. Now, it might just seem like you're just waving your hands at one another, but in all honesty, there is a certain strategy to that. When I'm sitting up there against John, and he throws rock for the second time in a row, I have to wonder, is he trying to psych me out? Is he going to throw rock again the third time so that when I go, so that when I go scissors, I'm going to lose? 
Or is he going to go paper? And if I throw rock for the third time, expecting him to change, I'm going to lose. There's a level of deep strategy to rock, paper, scissors that's become so culturally ingrained in our minds that we almost forget that we're doing it. And that makes it a compelling game. Now, strategy is also a compelling aspect of any good game because it encourages students to think. If they can think deeper about the game that they're learning, they can link that to thinking deeper about the lessons. They can relate being, oh wow, I got screwed over in class by my buddy. He turned around and stabbed me in the back. Hmm, Machiavelli says that we should stab our opponents in the back. I can link that to the test. And we've seen time and time again that that's actually, that's, that's actually the case. So rock, paper, scissors, and a level of deep strategy. Now finally, connectivity. As you can see there, I did a nice little, uh, I'm going to use this laser pointer because it's cool. Uh, a nice little helix drawing right there to show a little bit of interconnectivity. One of the most amazing things about board games is the way that it connects students, professors, facilitators, and the game itself together. Think about any other computer game that you're playing or any video game that you're playing. The main focus of your attention is on the screen. It's on the things that are going on in front of you, but not on the people that are playing next to you. But if you think of any typical board game setting, one of the most amazing things about it is that we're all looking at each other. And the same goes for rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors is the most interesting connected game. If I walk up to Anna and I start shaking my fist like this, everyone in the room gets a little bit uncomfortable. And with good reason, I shouldn't be sitting, you know, I shouldn't be standing up there shaking my fist in her face. But if Anna is doing the same thing to me, she's all up in my grill, I'm all up in hers, and we're playing rock, paper, scissors, no one bats an eyelash. How amazing is that, that that game has become so culturally ingrained in our minds and in our imaginations that that idea of personal space and personal boundaries is completely removed. If a student can connect with the game and connect with the facilitator of that game, they're going to learn so much more than if they just treat it as a lesson. One of the big problems that we have with lessons and the things that we've learned is that a lesson plan or a lecture is a simple one-dimensional weapon, method of learning. Me, as the lecturer, is telling you something and you, as a receptacle of learning, are hopefully understanding it, hearing it, and then regurgitating it later in a test. But if you and I can connect, if you and I can make a connection through the game, and you can learn the things that I'm trying to teach you, you can link them to the things that I'm trying to say, combine that with what you do in the game, we get a three-dimensional model of learning. And a model of learning that not only results in greater test scores, but also a greater sense of historical imagination. <laughs> cool story, bro, but why does it matter? Um, that's very cool, by the way, for all of those who are comic book fans. I just really enjoy the picture and that goofy smile of his. But the truth is, why does it matter? Thank you, of course, for asking that disembodied voice. But the truth is, is that why this matters is that not everyone learns very well through lecture form. Um, you're always going to have students that struggle with the typical method of learning and the typical pedagogical techniques in the classroom. One of the most amazing things that we've found through our ideas of gaming is that we can teach a facet of historical time periods, we can teach cultural imagination, and we can even teach things as simple as key terms through the games that we use. And not only that, but because the students are active participants in the lesson, through the game, they actually learn more, they actually retain that information, and they actually combine that stuff into higher test scores. Our findings. As you can see there, this graph has five colors on it, uh, all split into five different sections. None of them are relevant because it's something that I got off of a Google stock image. Um, however, one of the things that we did find throughout this, through both our student evaluations, uh, which students fill out at the end of each year when they're evaluating their courses, and through actually talking to our students one-on-one -on -one during and after class, is that students link our games to a greater sense of historical imagination, to understanding key terms and definitions on tests, and to actually feeling more comfortable with the test material, so greater confidence with our lessons. That's why this matters. Not only are they having fun, but they're able to integrate it in a way that allows them to do better on the material and to understand things in a greater way. Now I want to talk to you guys a little bit about certain things that happen uh, throughout our games playtesting. I want to play a game with you all in class, but, or class I should say, uh, but sadly that takes a little bit too long. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the findings that we've had. Now one of the things that we found was called the McLean Factor. And this occurred in Dreadnoughts and Diplomacy, which is a game that we designed based on World War I. Now, Everyone is split into 10 different teams. Each of these teams has two players. One player is a diplomat trying to prevent war, and the other one is a warmonger trying to push their country's forces into the trenches. Well, this game was designed to show how hard it would have been to avert warfare in 1914, essentially, uh, when the tides of nationalism were very strong and people were starting to already arm up. We played the game once. Dreadnoughts and Diplomacy was designed as a one-shot game to teach this lesson, but we had a group of enterprising students, three of which are in this audience right now, uh, come to us after class and say, we can beat this game. If you put us all on diplomats, we can beat this game. 
and Doc and I being the avid historians that we are and being people that want to answer a question when it's asked, we said, all right, let's do it. Let's absolutely do it. So sure enough, the day comes, our diplomats all gather together, and for a little bit, it looks like they might actually do it. And I'm sitting up there in the desk and I'm watching this happen and I go, well, star spangle my banners, the boys might actually pull it off. And then everything falls apart. One of the diplomats, who is also sitting in this audience, decided to bring two of their friends to the play test. Uh, this is where we draw the name of the McLean factor from. One of them is a, a young sophomore named Tyler McLean. Tyler got bored throughout the game. Tyler got very, very bored. And once he got bored, he decided that it was time to start a war, regardless of everybody of what everybody else was doing. And slowly, Tyler and the other person, a man by the name of Nate Guest, another sophomore, slowly started to jack up the tense of tension and jack up the prices of weapons and eventually push the whole world into conflict. Now, what's interesting is everybody blamed those two players. But later on, throughout the semester, we found out the truth. That it wasn't just these two players that had thrown a monkey wrench into things. A few of the other team members on opposite sides and in different countries had been cheating. They had been putting in extra war points when they shouldn't have been. And another one of the diplomats, who was completely unrelated to this, actually sold out one of their smaller allies for the chance at free victory points. Going, yeah, oh, it's completely fine. Break our alliance. You'll be safe over there. We won't attack you. And then turned on them immediately. We wanted to teach a lesson about human nature during this time period. And we wanted to teach how hard it was going to be to avoid war when war seemed almost inevitable. And in the second playtest, I think we did that more than anything. That's just messed up. Now, I've talked a little bit about historical imagination throughout the presentation uh, and why it's important for people to understand how it must have been like to live in a time period and what it would have been like to put yourself in that time period's shoes, so to speak. We were playing a game called Head of the Curve. Like I said, 90% of this is going to be pun-based. Head of the Curve is a game based on the French Revolution. Skidooch. Uh, guillotine jokes. They're wonderful. Tell them apart. People will love it. Uh, in any case, one of the mechanics of a Head of the Curve is that you, as a member of the revolution, have to see which one of your classes, classmates, are friends of the revolution or enemies of the revolution. Once you've selected somebody for execution, they can go to the middle of the class and they can plead for their life. Now, this sounds like a fun game mechanic, and it kind of was. It was interesting. We had a few people uh, give very impassioned speeches, then we had a couple of people go, screw you guys, I don't care if I die, you're all a bunch of jerks. Um, all of which was very funny and very informative. But at one point, a student who was sitting in front of me looked behind me and said, and that's really messed up, making people beg for their lives like that. And I replied and I said, it's really messed up until the point where you realize people did this for real. And his face dropped, and he looked at me, and in that moment, he got it. He understood that we were trying to convey something much greater than the game, and something far more than just a simple lesson could convey. He understood that this was a reality for people. Uh, and in that moment, his sense of historical imagination skyrocketed. And it was exactly what we were trying to do. Any questions? Um, I know I've said a lot in the last however long, 20 minutes, 30 minutes almost. Uh, something along those lines, but uh, it, I, I love questions. I'm not, you're not going to offend me or, or break my spirit, I swear. So uh, you can choose to ask as many as you want or as little as you want. Yes? Um, do you think a lot of your games seem like players backstabbing each other and war mechanics? Do you think you're teaching children like the wrong message in your games? No, no, I, I would say that we're not teaching our, teaching our students the wrong lessons. Um, we're teaching them lessons that things would have been, as things would have been taught in history. The important thing about these games is that the students aren't playing them by themselves, but rather they're playing them with a facilitator, somebody that can help them understand the lesson and integrate the game with a greater sense of understanding. So for example, uh, the Dreadnoughts and Diplomacy, the game based on World War I, isn't saying that warfare is completely inevitable. Um, one of the things that was amazing about it was that we had so many students who actually came up and said, no, we can prevent war, we can stop this, we can make this not a thing. Um, and again, that game wasn't designed to make warfare inevitable, just to make it hard to stop. Um, and, and the other case of the art games, one of them is called The Prince, in which case, you know, you probably need to stab some, some people in the back. But that's a lesson that we associate directly with the text, not with greater human understanding and with greater historical understanding. And with the right facilitator, which is somebody who understands history and somebody who understands these games, um, you can get those lessons across without any, any real worry about the student's moral fiber, so to speak. Uh, any other questions? Yes? How did you balance uh, lecture with using these games and 
How do we balance lecture with these in the classroom setting? What we usually did was we would have a prep time, essentially. So uh, for the historically based games class, which I'm a teaching assistant for now, uh, what we did is we usually had a week worth of lectures and lessons, um, sort of getting people prepped and getting people ready for the time period. And then the, the following week after that, we would play the games. Um, and it was nice to have that kind of juxtaposition between regular learning, just so people understood what we were trying to go for, and the actual game themselves. Um, and I'll be honest, if I was to do this again, I would actually do less lecture. Um, students didn't need it. I didn't feel like they did. They did anyway. Students got the lessons that we hmm, excuse me the lessons that we were trying to teach almost immediately afterwards, with just a little bit of help and a little bit of prodding. Uh, one of the things that we did, as opposed to actual lectures, uh, is we put to squat is bleh, I swear to God I can talk. I promise. Uh, we put discussion questions after the games. And what this did was it let people relate what we were trying to ask them to what they had done during the game. Um, so if, if anything, I would do less lecture. Um, I, think students, I think students achieved a decent understanding just through the games themselves. Any other questions? John? Uh, it seems like, <clears throat> sorry, that the uh, idea for the class seems to hit on uh, what uh, I remember hearing about in uh, sociology and psychology where uh, a lot of students have difficulty learning in lecture, but not only that, but they need to be hands-on and feel more personal experience. Yes. And that uh, that seems to be the focus of not only using games, but uh, making them have to relate personally to the experience, putting them in the situations of, you know, in history, such as the what we're going one game that you brought up. You know, you put them going, hey, this is what's happening, and they have to deal with those stressors. Mm -hmm. And by making it more personal, you seem to make it more accessible. Yes, was there, was there a question in there? Uh, yeah, the main question is, was this the initial goal? Did you have that forethought in mind? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do, other than just design things that were typical lectures, I'm a hands-on learner. Uh, Kinesthetic tactile, I think, is the actual term for yeah. it. I learn hands-on. I love learning hands-on. And one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to draw the students out of their shell. Uh, we're not looking for the typical student here with these games. The typical student, the one that, or the, I guess the atypical student, the one that does very well with lectures, they can still benefit from this, and they're going to still benefit from it regardless, but we're looking for the student that doesn't usually relate to the typical methods. Um, we want people to get involved, and we've had amazing success with getting people involved. Even people who are the quote-unquote the shy students, the ones that like sit in the corner. I'll never forget, we ran a debate in class on whether or not it was better to compete with one another or cooperate with one another. And there's this little girl, she's about five feet tall, very quiet, very, very demure, very reserved, and at the end of class stood up and basically delivered one of the best arguments about it ever. One big essential like, screw you guys, I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, and this is why it relates to games, this is how it relates to history, and this is what I've been sitting on this entire semester and I've just now found the courage to say. And then she walked out, this class was over. Uh, and I'll never forget that moment, it was incredible to watch a student who had literally gone from sitting down, not saying anything, to being an active part of the class, and being a dominant part of the class. So yes, we, from the get-go, we designed these games to reach every kind of student, from the one that responds well to lectures to the ones that don't. Any other questions? Yes, Adam. Um, so for example, my father absolutely hates board games. Yes. Um, and presumably, you ran into some students that share a similar opinion. I mean, if this is, you said that there's the lectures, but I mean, how, if primarily the, the class is to teach through board games, how do you reach those students that don't necessarily engage or have any interest in board games. I What's, mean, uh, I, go ahead. Yeah, no, okay, good, good. I'm, trying to make, I'm not trying to make sure I'm not cut you off. Mm -hmm. um, one of the cool things about this is there's sort of like a crowd factor to it. Uh, the students that typically don't like board games see their friends having fun and realize that they're doing something that's really cool and interacting in a different way and are immediately pushed towards that. And the other thing that we did was we call them board games, um, but realistically they're more classroom games than anything else. Almost all of these games have been designed so that you can play them with nothing more than a piece of chalk, a couple coins, if you have a dice or a deck of cards lying around, you can play them. You don't need to print out a game board for a lot of these games that we've designed. You don't need to go out and like buy a bunch of extra stuff for a lot of the games we designed. Because we understood that that was a barrier not only to students, but to teachers who didn't want to have the extra overhead and the extra setup time. So we actually designed a lot of these in mind for those people that are like, yeah, I really don't want a board, I don't engage that way. And we have a lot of games that are just strict classroom interaction games. Uh, as well, but in, in interest to the other point where you know you said that generally people, some people don't like games. We did have a few students that started the semester not liking games, and because they saw their friends interacting and realized that this was actually something that was kind of cool and atypical, 
uh, decided to jump in on it as well and had, had, had a really good time with it and learned a lot too, so proof of successful there. Yes, Anna? Um, I know that you probably, I don't know if you had any teaching experience before you did this, but maybe you can speak to Dr. Murray. Did you find as the teacher it was hard to let go of the class and kind of give responsibility over the students when you weren't lecturing? Um, no, I'll, I'll be honest. Now, this was my first like formal teaching experience, but I have experience with residence life being an RA, and I've had experience helping to run classes and facilitate class discussions prior to that. But this is my first like official, I guess, teaching experience, you could say. And I, I didn't have any problem. Uh, I will say we had a fantastic class this semester. We had a class that really took learning and took their engagement to the next level. I would like to think some of that was because of Dr. Murray and I. Um, but one of the coolest things about this, and one of the best things about the project, is that it really does let students sort of make this learning whatever they want to make it. Um, you're kind of giving them a playground and then letting the student experience what they want to do within that sandbox. So no, no, it was, it was actually fantastic to watch the students sort of make what lessons they want to, and then after that sort of facilitate them like, this is what you built in our metaphorical sandbox. Here's what, here's what it means. So uh, no, I didn't, I didn't have any problem turning it loose to them, in all honesty. If, if anything, the students this semester proved that turning it loose to them and allowing them to be active participants in their own education, uh, letting them forge their own paths in the classroom was the best type of teaching method. I think they'll learn more through that than through anything Dr. Murray and I have said. So. Yeah, no more questions, please. Fire them off, let's go. Did you use any untraditional methods of assessment? Did you use traditional things like tests and papers, or did you do anything Yeah, we still had tests, we still had papers, we still had a couple quizzes. Um, so, you know, there, you can't completely get away from, uh, you have to put grades in at the end of the day, <laughs> which is essentially the, the issue. But no, uh, we, we did use a couple, I, I, don't, I don't want to call them stereotypical, but uh, typical methods of education and uh, of assessment within those things. But for the most part, students were able to do pretty well in those as well. So again, I can't speak to the exact grades because Dr. Marie has the great book. And my lovely mentor has decided not to show up at the presentation, but we love him anyway. Um, any other questions? Yes. So you talked a lot about uh, connectivity, and obviously in the setting that you were in with the board games or the card games, it allowed for that. Um, do you think that there's a way, uh, I know you mentioned like video games and electronic mm -hmm. historical, historically based video games. Do you think that if you took some of the games that, or something similar to what was designed for this class and made it for a virtual console or for a PC or like a handheld, um, do you think you'd lose that connectivity? And if you do, is that detracting from the overall message and what you were trying to achieve when you set out to do this? Yes and yes. Um, so the first one, do I think I'd lose that connectivity? Absolutely. Uh, I've played games like that. One of my favorite games is Assassin's Creed. Uh, one of the funny stories that we like to tell about historically based games is that my cousin got lost in Florence on a study abroad trip and was able to navigate his way back to the group because he knew the streets of Rome or who knew the streets of Florence, I apologize, from playing Assassin's Creed so much. So clearly there is something that can be learned from these games. Uh, but one of the key aspects of learning, as I mentioned before, is that A, you have a facilitator who helps you understand the lessons, and B, you get drawn into it because everyone else is sort of doing it. Everyone else is experiencing it, and you want to be a part of it. Uh, in a game, you're free to explore, your, in a video game, you're free to explore whatever routes that you want but you're not free to experience those um, through the lens of other people. And so having a facilitator to help like, showcase the lessons that you want them to understand and the lessons that you want them to teach, the lessons that are gonna be important for their, I guess, greater historical imagination, their understanding of a time period, and more importantly, having friends that are going to drive forward that learning. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say for those of us that were in my class this semester who are sitting in the audience that um, I think the students themselves were motivating factors. Um, for one another, at least from what I observed. So, yeah, I think you lose something intrinsic in playing, making a video game. Not to say that video games aren't great, or that you know clearly you can you can navigate modern Italy through them. There's actually they recreated this experiment. There's a fun video on YouTube. I'm sorry to go on a little tangent, but uh, they recreated this experiment with the new Assassin's Creed Unity game, which is set in France during the French Revolution. Sadly, they have no guillotine-based puns. They dropped the ball on that one. Um, but they actually gave somebody the handheld game. They gave somebody the game and then use the game to navigate through the streets of Paris, and they actually managed to do that effectively too. So clearly there's something there, but you miss out on a huge intrinsic part of the lesson, I think, if you just, if you just reduce it to the, I guess, the, the realm of the handheld or the realm of the video game. Other questions? Awesome, thank you 
all so much for coming. I appreciate it, uh, especially those of you who have seen this presentation once or twice. Thank you so much. Um, and that will be the end of the show. Thank you.